So go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 for our text. It's maybe a little bit of an odd verse for what we're going to consider, but we'll help get our thoughts going here. I think we all know Genesis 1 1. It says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I'd like us to consider what heaven is today. Amen. Now, there are three heavens spoken of in the scriptures. There's the first heaven, which is the sky immediately above us. Uh, verse 20 describes it as, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly and moving creatures, and the half light and the fowl that may fly above the earth, the open and permanent of heaven. That is the first heaven, the one Man. earth's atmosphere, we might call it. Then there is the second heaven, that is everything that man can see outside of earth's atmosphere, what we would call outer space. Mm -hmm. It's described really in verses 14 through 18. He says, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, for seasons, and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. Well, this is speaking of the moon, the stars, the sun, all that is out there in what we call outer space. Amen. And then there is third heaven, what we often refer to as heaven with a capital H. That's the abode of God, the heaven of heaven that is called the Old Testament. Amen. Uh, Paul in 2 Corinthians 2 does call it the third heaven. When he said he knew a man that was caught up into the third heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some teachings out there that say there's seven heavens or Ten heavens, and I believe it's the Islam teaches that there are seven different heavens. Mm. But no, there's only one heaven as the abode of God, and Amen. Then the heavens above us, and no man cannot pass towards the heaven as in the abode of God. He can. So it is a spiritual place, not a physical place that man can you know, shoot a rocket up to one day and get to. Amen. And I think because one, scripture don't give us much description of physical of the physical place, and also because it is a spiritual place and natural man cannot discern the things of the spirit, man has made up lots of ideas about what heaven is. Right. There is nothing about streets of gold or gates of pearl about when we talk about this heaven. That is the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven, so it's it's possible that that's there, but the scriptures don't say that it is so. And it certainly will not be about you or what you want. Right. And that is one common misconception, at least in our society. Amen. The heaven's going to be all about what you want or what you like. And what, you know, heaven is... As we'll see here in a moment, it's all about really God. And I'd like to look at this third heaven and examine what the scriptures say about it. First, we can turn to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 9. I had wondered if this heavenly boat of God had always existed or. When he says he created heaven, if he had made it then, but Nehemiah says here in chapter nine, verse number six, "Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts and the earth and all the things that are therein, seas and all that is therein. Thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worship thee." That <coughs> God has created all, even. This place, which we call his abode today. And God is there, obviously. That is one of the most obvious ones. Psalm 115, verse 3 Our God is in the heavens. He has done whatsoever he has pleased. We can turn over to 1 Kings and see that he is not confined to heaven. You bet. 1 Kings in chapter 8. 
This is also echoed in 2 Chronicles chapter 6. This is when Solomon was to build the temple. First Kings 8, verse 27. And Solomon is praying here. He says, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the heavens of heaven cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have built. And that's speaking of the temple, and he says, Well, how is God going to dwell in this temple if even the, the heaven and the heavens of heaven can't contain him? We know that God is omnipresent, that he's everywhere. That I think David said in the Psalms that if he, make, if he goes up to heaven, he is there. If he makes his bed in hell, he is there. He's there. But yet, what we think of as the full glory of God, that is in the place called heaven at the moment. Mm -hmm. Man cannot see that glory. Man cannot, in his natural state, go there. But yet, one day we will go there and we'll see. Obviously, another point is that Christ is there. Luke 22, verse 69, Christ said that, and hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power of God. Amen. And then we know in Acts chapter 7, and verse 56, when Stephen was being stoned, he said, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of the throne of God. So God is there and Christ is there. That is two points that we must keep in mind. I know it seems obvious, but with them being there, there is nothing else that really matters a whole lot, is there? That's it. Amen. With them being there, we'll see that there's no there's no room for sin, there's no room for <clears throat> The great tempter Satan, there's no room for any of these other things. You can turn over to Philippians. I think we probably have heard this verse before, but Philippians 1, verse 23. Betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. He goes on to say, Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Mm -hmm. But for the child of God to depart is to be with Christ. And we know that He is in heaven, so we will be there as well. Mm -hmm. Also, 2 Corinthians 5 8 says that we, when we're absent from the body, we're present with the Lord. Amen. And there's no middle ground for the child of God. There's no purgatory as the Catholics teach. Right. We either lift up our eyes in hell or we go to be with the Lord. Yet this heaven is not the eternal place in which we live. We will come back and reign with him for a thousand years on that new heaven and new earth. Mm -hmm. well, I don't profess to know whether we'll go back to heaven or if we'll stay on the new heaven and new earth. I suppose we would for the rest of eternity. But that heaven that we go to is not the place where we're going to spend the rest of eternity. Amen. Oh, it will be a blessed place for the child of God, but we'll be there in a 1 Corinthians 5 also describes how that we, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians 5 also describes how that we will be longing for that new body. Amen. And our earthly tabernacle will be dissolved. If I can describe it, it's more of a, a waiting place for the time when the time shall be no more. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let's go over to Revelation chapter 19. We get a few glimpses of what is going on in heaven in Revelation. In verse number one, this is after the, through the fall of Babylon, but this is descriptive of what is even going on now. It says, and after these things, I heard a great voice, verse number one, 
a bunch of people in heaven saying hallelujah, salvation, glory, and honor, and power in the Lord our God. Amen. There's this great collective praise to God that is happening even in heaven now. Really, that will be our primary function throughout all eternity, I believe, is to serve and to praise God. If you go back to chapter 7 of Revelation, we'll see that there is serving God in heaven. It's not some place we're going to be sitting around on some clouds right. floating around like right. Right. the world teaches. It's not going to be people feeding you grapes or <laughs> doing things that are pleasurable to you. Revelation 7 verses 13 through 15 say, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. We see it. The saints of God. Amen. And therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. You see here they are serving God. And it goes on to say, They shall hunger no more, neither thirst no more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. The land which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them with the living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all their tears, all tears from their eyes. Amen. You see here this heaven, there's gonna be no no hungry, no thirsty anymore, for God shall be the sustainer of it. He said there to be no sun to light upon them nor any heat. That's good for a mailman who has to work in the heat. <laughs> <laughs> there won't. He said there will be no more of these things, but rather we will be just with God and he shall even wipe away all our tears, he says. Amen. And we know we're in the, talking about the new Jerusalem, he says, that he shall wipe away all our tears, and there will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor pain, nor crying. Yet, the exact opposite is what waits for the unsaved, isn't it? The Amen. place of eternal weeping and torments. Let's go back over to Luke for a moment. We'll see some more description of heaven. Luke chapter 15. Verse number 7 says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. You can go. Verse 10 echoes the same thing. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Amen. There is joy in heaven. I said there will be no more sorrow there. There's going to be, there will be no envying or covetousness there. There will be only eternal joy in the presence of God. <coughs> Even more so, he says, when there's a sinner that repents. Amen. There must be some awareness of what's going on here on earth. I don't know that we're looking through the floors of the holes in the floor of heaven as one country song says. But <laughs> there at least is some awareness of what is going on here, but they know when the sinners repent and they rejoice over it. Amen. Going back to Matthew chapter 6, we see again another description of what this heaven is like. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, we often quote these when talking about earthly treasure. He says, Lay not up for yourself treasure upon earth, where your moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where the thieves do not break through nor steal. Amen. There'll be no thieves there, no stealing, no. As he says here, moth or rust to corrupt. There will be really no corruption at all in heaven. Amen. You know, that first truck you bought, Brother Larry, it had a lot of rust on it, didn't it? Yes. <laughs> My old truck does too. So there won't be any rust in heaven. Amen. Now, from a physical aspect, I don't know if that means there'll be no 
iron there or no oxygen there. That's the two things you need to make rust. But either which way, there's going to be no corruption of any kind there. Amen. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to worry about locking your doors and someone stealing your stuff. Right. You will see here in this moment, there's really no sin there at all. As we know, in according to Habakkuk, that God is of such pure eyes and look upon iniquity that he cannot really have it dwelling in his presence. Mm -hmm. Let's go to one of the more famous verses, John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verse, go ahead and read the first three verses. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So he says, in his Father's house, that's in the current abode of God, he says, there are many mansions. This mansion can just mean dwellings or places of abode, but I'm sure they are fine places. Amen. Many, many of us live in mansions compared to what the common people did in Christ's days. Right. I don't know what they look like, but the mansions really shouldn't be our main concern anyway. Right. So there's gospel songs that I want to mention that's Silver lined. <laughs> I like the song better just to that be satisfied with just a cabin over in the corner. Amen. Well, just to be with God is what should matter, but there are mansions there, Christ says. There are places for us to abide. There are probably grand places to look upon, but yet Christ said He goes to prepare a place for us. Mm -hmm. so, greater than those mansions is the place that Christ. Goes prepared for us, and that one day he will come again and receive us to himself. That is what we really ought to be longing for. Yeah. I'd like to go to Colossians chapter 3 and we'll close. This one might be a little more abstract in our thinking here, but he describes the things which are of earth and the things which are above. <laughs> Verse number one, he says, if he then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is on the right hand of God. So we see once again that Christ is there in heaven. Verse 2, he says, set your affection on things above and on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Who, or excuse me, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Amen. When Christ comes again, he will... So we will appear with him. We shall be caught up with him and meet him in the air if we're still alive. Or yeah. Then I shall rise first. Now verses 5 through 9 really describe what will not be in heaven. These are the things that are of earth. He says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, and inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things... For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked in some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Amen. These things will not be in heaven because they are earthly things. They are the things which we are to not set our affections on even now. All these sins, and even probably more so than what's listed here, but sums it up pretty well. And it's hard to imagine a place where this does not enter into. Amen. There's no, not even lying anymore. There's no filthy communication. He said there's no anger, there's no wrath. So there's no envying and covetousness. All these things are done away with in heaven, and ultimately, and we spend eternity with him. He goes on in verse 10, he says, And I put on the new man, which is renewed in 
knowledge after the image of him that created him. And certainly we are a new man in Christ now, but one day we'll be fully realize that when we put on this incorruptible, Amen. We put on that immortal body, we are fully changed to his image. As Philippians tells us, when he shall change our vile bodies into body like his glorious body. Like I said, that is for later on. That is not for the current heaven. Mm -hmm. But that does await the child of God. Going on through verse number 11, he says, Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. As Galatians 3.28 says, we are all one in Christ. Mm -hmm. There's not going to be a, a Greek heaven and a Jewish heaven. There's not going to be a white heaven and a black heaven. Amen. But we are all one in Christ. And that's something we are to remember here on this earth as well. That there's not one that's better than the other. Right. Then the verses 12 through 17 describe what we should be longing for and striving after now that it will be perfectly applied to us in heaven. He says in verse 12, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. Amen. Any man have a quarrel against thee or against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, where is the bond of perfectness, and let the Peace of God will in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, and do, so do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Amen. Imagine a place where mercy abounds and peace abounds and forgiveness abounds and that is a place called heaven. It will be certainly fully realized when we put on that new body. But Amen. It is even how it is in heaven now, I believe. Yeah. That all these things that are in, all these other things that we mentioned in the previous verses cannot enter in there. But when we consider all what heaven is biblically, it's not exactly what the flesh desires, is it? Right. It's not what man thinks of heaven, but man... The heaven being the abode of God is all about Him and serving Him and praising Him. I want to read something from Brother Pink. I didn't write it in my notes, but I do have it here on my phone. Speaking of regeneration, he says, Regeneration is indispensably necessary before any soul can enter heaven. In order to love spiritual things, a man must be made spiritual. And that man may hear about them and have a correct idea of the doctrines of them, but he cannot love them. 2 Thessalonians 2.10 Nor find his joy in them. None can dwell with God and be eternally happy in his presence until a radical change has been wrought in the kingdom. Amen. A change from sin to holiness, and this change must take place on earth. Mm. That man is not going to love the things of God in the natural man. And if you don't love those things, you certainly will not love heaven. Right. Everyone talks about wanting to go to heaven, but they don't want to talk about their love for God or love the, the things of God. That's it. Most people just don't want to go to hell as a reality. Right. Well, you must be born again. As John, or excuse me, as Christ said in John 3, no man can enter into the kingdom of God except you be born again. Mm -hmm. Amen. Marvel, not that I say me, you must be born again. So the natural man has his ideas of heaven, but he cannot comprehend the real heaven, the real abode of God. Because they are spirits who discern, therefore he must be made a new man. And don't think that you're going to get up as the common teaching is that you're going to stand before Peter at the pearly gates and he's going to check the list and see your names on it. That's not right. how heaven works either. Just as Pink said, it must, the change must take place here on earth. You must Amen. be born again. You must be saved by the grace of God. Otherwise, yeah. eternity in the lake of fire is what awaits. Yes. We're going to close with that thought. Amen.